Welcome to VUC 2019, Visions Under Construction. That's really funny. Apparently, I forgot to record it is what happened. We're talking about uh, the funny little scanner thing there. We're going to go through our little events uh, calendar very quickly. Berlin, Germany, May 6th to 8th, Camillo World. One of the finest uh, things you could do for yourself. Get a budget. Tell your boss, hey, I got to go to Camillo World, you know, because we're going to meet all the great people there. The next thing in line is Com... That's uh, irritating. The next thing in line is ComCon 2019, which is the 7th to 9th July at Latimer Estate, Buckinghamshire, UK. Are they going to change the U to D to disunited or what? Anyway, next thing in my list is ComCon, the ClueCon, sorry, said ComCon, ClueCon, Chicago, August 5th to 8th. And then later, a kind of a complex thing that includes Tad Hack. It's in October, but the III, and I can never pronounce this, IIT, real-time communications, that's uh, the more scientific community related to the uh, Illinois Tech and all of that. And finally, a mention, is that it? Yeah. Finally, a mention of this, the petition uh, in the United Kingdom to get the government to talk more. Maybe, Corrado, maybe you can um, actually explain exactly what this is. But the point is, went on yesterday, went live yesterday morning here in our time zone over. Uh, and it was a few hundred thousand. They needed a hundred thousand to look at it. And today, 24 hours later, it was already two million. Now it's, as you can see, it's three million. The site went down several times. They have never, the, the petition site people said that they've never seen anything like this as far as response. Corrado, uh, can you summarize the, the, the point of this thing? Well, uh, I try to be quick. Uh, there is a structure in the uh, UK Parliament where you can submit petitions. And there's a website under it. Uh, it's run on uh, Amazon Web Services. Mm -hmm. And I have a good authority that to uh, find the, the onslaught of uh, connect connections and services that requested. They had to uh, increase the, the the supply that the, what they buy from AWS fifty fold, fifty times. Uh, so uh, yeah, it, it's pretty pretty heavy. Uh, at a point, uh, because it needs to send you an email that you need to click a link to confirm that you've um, practically. Um, you're you're not cheating, okay? That you're a real person, that you have an email address. Uh, e those emails for the conf confirmation uh, were were taking about three and a half hours to go through. So uh, an estimation of the queue was about three hundred thousand uh, emails that were uh, queuing out of the servers for confirmation. So the total that you might see even here and now might be well behind of the people that has already signed on the website and is just waiting for that email confirmation email to come through right um the the, the point is that the um um sorry i got distracted by uh, hank that has a, a problem with the audio uh the, um a, a petition uh, if it passes 10,000 uh, signatories, must be uh, addressed and answered by the government or the parliament. Uh, if it passes 100,000 people, is uh, has to be discussed in parliament or by the government. We are way in except in in a, in a excess of three and a half thousand, three three and a half million people that have signed uh, that petition to practically uh, revoke uh, Article 50 and uh, remain in the EU. Uh, that probably was triggered by, yes, a, just a standard normal person using the, uh, the, 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 uh, the site to uh, put that to the forefront, because so far in the discussion, uh, it appeared that only the deal that Theresa May uh, with the EU has thrashed together and living without a deal were the options. Whereas instead, 
uh, there has been a, a, a court case that went through the European Court of Justice, if, if I uh, remember correctly, uh, made by six uh, Scottish uh, MPs and QCs. QCs is Queen Council's. So they're very spe special barrister. I thought this was going to be short. <laughs> uh, well, it's quite complicated, but the, they the, went uh, through the, the ECJ uh, and uh, had a, 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 um, a decision by the ECJ that uh, the UK can withdraw the Article 50 notice at any okay. point, at any moment, without uh, the requirement for any uh, Placid from the EU. It's just a decision for the UK. And I am uh, showing the uh, URL in case if there's somebody on the planet that hasn't seen this yet. And the reason I even. Uh, okay, to... just before we go ahead, uh, only UK citizens and UK residents can uh, uh, subscribe and vote for the petition. UK citizens means that everyone that is abroad on uh, which, whichever continent they are. As far as they are UK citizens, they can sign the petition. Absolutely. And everyone that is resident in the UK of whatever other nation on the planet can sign the petition. Right. Someone that is not a UK citizen and is not living in the UK cannot sign it. Correct. And uh, the, one of the reasons that this is really serious, too, is that I have friends here, for example, who uh, uh, there's a British woman living here. And, if the UK leaves Europe, the status of people like that is totally unknown. And the reason I wanted to speak about, to even uh, in talk about this at all, is because of the success of the, um, the petition and the way it was spread out and the way it went viral, where it started and it got on Twitter and people were retweeting it and retweeting. I don't have this, unfortunately, I don't have the statistics of how this happened and I'm not on Facebook, but it was the spread of this. I would love to see if somebody could do a graph or a map of the spread of how people got into this. It's just amazing. And I think it's an important phenomenon, phenomenon, phenomenon in French of our time. Um, so with that, we're going to move on to something, but I just thought this was significant. Also, they had to stop re they had to stop updating it with Ajax because it was that was also bringing the site down. So now it doesn't update live anymore. Um, and at one point there were, I counted 1500 a minute as far as the increases. Obviously it's slowed down now, but 3,360,000 3, is huge already. And it would be great if they could make it up to the, what is it, the 17,500 they need or something? 17 million uh, yeah. that, that voted for for Brexit in 2016, but uh, we know that is no longer it's no longer a majority because all um, formal polls that are are being made say that about 55 to 58 to 60 percent of the UK population population is for Remain now, uh, and not just because uh, Remain is probably the best option, but because of the total incapacity of the UK government to come. And, the, and parliament to come to an agreement to what is Brexit, to what is I, happening. When we, we started with that meme that Brexit means Brexit, and it exactly is that. It's meaningless. It's self-referential, and nobody knows what it really means. Yeah. So uh, it, it will never happen because nobody was no, knows what it is. Right. Okay, we're going to move on and call on Jay. Jay, hey, you had some ideas of things we were going to talk about because um, lots of things happened this week in tech, but um, there's nothing specific that I could bring up except that that whole event of the virality of, uh, of this petition. I've never seen anything like it. I think it's great. Jay? Uh, is he muted? No, we, I'm not hearing you, and I don't know if it's... Is any muted locally. Yeah, you must be muted locally. Check your microphone. Okay, while well, he's doing that. This uh, we, we had an upgrading on on Chrome uh, yeah. this week, so probably <laughs> we're fixing. So I wondered if Hank was having. That's why maybe Hank had the problem. I don't. A lot of funny things happen. Are you, are you Hank? You must be on Chrome, right? And what OS? Actually, no, I'm on um, I'm on Safari under Mac OS. Okay, yeah, yeah, that's the other one. You know, I use Firefox all day, and Firefox doesn't work with Hangouts. And I'm convinced no, that Google, it's, I'm over that too. I'm I'm convinced that Google actually slows down Gmail for Firefox. I don't know how, but I, I just 
have this feeling that it's intentional because nothing else is slow on Firefox, particularly because when they refactored it a year ago, it's been like molasses. Since. Well, there is that. <laughs> True, yeah. yeah, I have an insight in that. Uh, Google is trying to use Q Quick QIC, the QIC protocol mm -hmm. uh, that is using UDP to do transmission of data transmission instead of using the standard TCP. On uh, everything, though. Uh, sorry. On everything. Uh, between your computer if you're using chrome and their servers and so uh if you see uh, chrome behaving uh, and uh, differently from firefox or anything else is because they are it's using uh, some kind of proprietary protocol that is is q yeah. u i ah, but, it, but it's not but it's AI. not proprietary anymore it's now no, no. p3 yeah. isn't it using ai yeah, well, they practically, yes that. but it is running on udp so it's not secure it's not uh, self um self-adjusting, self-fixing if there's a, a packet loss or something. Yeah, it, it, it's performance over reliability is what they're yeah. seeking at the moment. Yeah. Mm. Or move move reliability into the application layer out of the network stack. Exactly. Right. I don't know. Anyway, I'm kind of addicted to Gmail, so I'm not sure. Well, I wish I could find something that wasn't a good alternative. I, I had a um, I had a Stride Collab now, and I still have... Um, I still have accounts there, but I'm just, it's just not working as well as I thought. So I'm trying to find somebody, I'm trying to get out of Gmail as much as I try to get out of uh, Facebook and Twitter. I've been less successful with that. What um, I like about Gmail is the filters, and I guess even Outlook does that. Not that I, not that I would use Outlook. I'm, I mean, other, yeah, no, I know. <laughs> Quick fan away the stink. You know, that, that is the most disgusting. I know people who love that, though. Business, you know. But yes. um, no, the way Gmail set up, I really like it. And I'm not worried about Google reading my mail. I don't care about that. And I don't have anything that crazy anyway in my mail. And I do have an account. I finally paid for an account for a couple of years on Proton Mail. So if I ever have to do an encrypted mail, I guess I can, although that's not a point for me, really. I just thought no, it was and a good thing to fi help finance them, though. Yeah. I, I Again, I, I've been unhappy with the Collab Now stuff. Um, I put that up a, in a blog post about that was what I found as my alternative because they had stuff that was like Google Docs. And those sorts of things um and then i mean i guess uh what do you call it um next cloud does a lot of that sort of stuff so i'm, I'm looking at maybe doing some self-hosting options and all of that but that, there's a lot of brain damage that goes along with that which i'm not necessarily looking at bringing on my own shoulders so for the time yeah. being i'm still using gmail as my primary email account some people um, talk about fast mail but i'll tell you something i had an experience with fast mail that completely put me off them they had a deal where you pay once for life, right? I don't know, it's 20 bucks or something. No ads, no signature, you know, because free mail has ads and signature. And then like um, a few years into that for life plan, one time only payment, uh, it was like, uh, oh, well, we're discontinuing that now. You got to pay. Interesting. Uh, you know, yeah, I mean, that's, you can't do that. I'm sorry. No. I've always there. There's a couple of sites that I've uh, done that lifetime membership. One is the uh, nutrition tracker that I use called uh, Chronometer, mm -hmm. which is an amazing system. If you if you're at all interested in quantified self uh, or tracking what you eat down to the amino acids level and all of that sort of stuff, it's an amazing system. Um, I'd love the, to uh, find a system that did that, but it would have to know what I was eating without me entering it. <laughs> Go ahead. Well, you have to do that. I you know, know, there was actually, I don't mean to segue, but there was actually uh, some services for you would take pictures of your food and it yeah. would enter it in for you. But it was farming that out to um, Southeast Asia and people would like manually look at the picture and try to figure out what it was. It had, did not have good. No, I want, I want the plug in in the throat or something, you know. That's sure. Or machine learning. Well, we'll do it all with machine learning. AI. AI. Oh, there we go. Uh, <laughs> uh, looking at Gmail and things that are going to happen, uh, are you mourning the loss of Inbox? That That is going. I liked it, but uh, they put the best features into Gmail, so I'm not worried about that. In fact, I haven't used it for months. Uh, okay. And yeah, that's probably why it is going. Did Nobody. You no, a lot of people loved it. There are people who were crazy. Did you use it, Corrado? No. Not at all. Did you? Anybody, Michael? No. Well, then there I... you go. I, I looked at it when it first came on, and then I meant to go back to try it, and then I never did, and I forgot about it until they told me it was being discontinued. So sounds like Alo and Duo. Oh my <laughs> anyway, god! 
which of the 16 different chat clients or the systems Google, yeah. the google graveyard uh no about inbox the thing is they had the the snooze feature is fantastic i love that but they put that in gmail so that's great okay jay's back with us let's see if we can hello jay hello ah we got you we go. something we're good oh. solved thanks i had to reboot no, I, uh, I'm sorry, I had uh, technical issues there, but I just, you know, I was listening to the, the conversation offline about uh, Brexit and all these different matters, and I just thought it might be interesting to talk a little bit about how technology, business models, and policy, and what I mean by policy is governance and government, is all sort of merging together and it's becoming very difficult to separate those three items and i think this you know the the heated debate over the uk being part of the european union or not uh, is you know comes within that category of uh you know we've got data privacy we've got facebook uh with you know uh, uh it, we are entrusting them with some of our uh, sensitive data. All this stuff is sort of melting together. And um, I think it's just, uh, I'm not sure people really appreciate how much these three areas, government, business policy, or business models, and technology is all melting together. So that's, that's basically what I wanted to throw out on the table. Okay. Yeah. That, that's that mm, i i've heard because i, I listen to uh, very quick podcasts in the morning that uh, today google has been fined another 1.7 billion euros uh for privacy or something else i, I was still a bit a, a half asleep when, it, uh, so i don't uh, remember Prado, isn't that the the browser bundling similar to internet i think that the google's the latest fine was that on android Chrome is a default browser, and they're required mm -hmm. to present the choice. Going back to the Microsoft days of Internet Explorer, you know, that thing. Yeah. Um, it's anti-whatever that anti is. Uh, Anti-competitive. Yeah, whatever. I mean, you know, does anybody care anymore? You're, it's easy enough to change, although maybe the average person doesn't. So apparently, yeah. uh, it, I, I can't remember whether I heard that it was Microsoft or somebody else who was doing this. And in fact, they have to present you with a palette of browsers in random order when you first set up the OS. I think that might that may even be Windows, or maybe it's Windows Mobile, which you know all four people running it were immediately. <laughs> I don't know how. Anyway, something like that. But so uh, the this Android thing, and that may be what you heard. I mean, Google's been fined so many times, and you know, 1.4 million euros to Google. That's like if I asked you for fifty pence. Oh, you know? Yeah, yeah. It, it's, all, it's all money they are they are taking away from uh, local governments in in ta unpaid taxes. So yeah. the governments are taking them back uh, using the back door of fining them because they don't like them. I'm not defending Honestly, Google. Though, the, the, the whole thing about the fine stuff, though, is when the fines are the equivalent of a mosquito bite, they're a cost of doing business, and you just move on. Right. Yeah. You, you accept the fine. The government continues spinning their wheels. They re issue a press release saying, look how we've bludgeoned this big company. And the company you know, takes no notice. They literally can't afford the staff time to address a fine that small. Uh, it's more or less the same thing that happened uh, and is still happening uh, here and probably somewhere else uh, about violations of electoral law. Uh, there are a number of parties, political parties, and also in the EU referendum that uh, have committed uh, electoral fraud uh, or violated electoral law about finance and everything else. And the fines, and, uh, uh, it's just fines, uh, so the, the result is not invalidated. And the fines are 5% of the money that they embezzled or guzzled down. So uh, yeah, it's cost of business, as, as, as Michael said. Uh, and that is literally... <sighs> The death of democracy because if you have money you buy what you want this may be what you were talking about carano I, unfortunately they don't put a date which is annoying as hell when an article doesn't start with the date so 
This is uh, the alphabet unit that was uh, hit with a third EU antitrust fine next week next week related to its AdSense advertising. That's right, there was another thing where they were screwing around, you know, giving their their network, it's a big surprise, right? They're giving their ad network, which is how they make money, uh, a precedence over anybody else's. So the FT reported for them, blah, 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 well, that's it, not much to that. Yeah. So that was that, but the, the, the mobile thing I mentioned happened too, and that's something else, I guess. Anyway, fine after fine. Well, fines because the, the there are damages, uh, but the problem is is like uh, I have a gripe with speeding cameras. Speeding cameras are not stopping the criminals or the stupid running a red light or or uh, going too fast in a in a uh, residential area. Right, it, it, it's just a punishment for after the fact. But the children have been run over already. Mm. It's not. It's not the way. To deal with problems is not finding people after the fact is stopping people doing the wrong things uh, you put uh, big round holes in the middle of the road that you have to negotiate if you need to stop people from speeding in a residential area it's a bad That's analogy but, uh, though, so that you don't so they don't have regulatory regulatory uh, equivalencies there no what you need is my you need minority report where you well the, the, the point right. the point on everything you get that's being brought up is do you see how the technology is blending with governance whether it's speeding cameras whether it's how you know ostensibly private companies are doing business and making their own decisions there's this melding together be it you know Antitrust policy, be it privacy, be it how we're how fast we're driving, but as we have progressed with technology and we become more and more connected, there's this blending together of these things, and I'm not sure anybody's really figured out how this is all going to be governed, because Google, in many senses. Is is like a virtual sovereignty. So Facebook, Facebook especially uh, as well. I mean, yeah. Are we going back to my old um, gripe of the internet that should that internet should become its own continent with its own government and legislation? Well, effectively, that's what's happening, Corrado. And you know, I, though. well, it's it's more than that, and I hate to use the uh, B word at this point, but this whole realm of decentralization and, and blockchain is wrestling with that very thing in that blockchain and decentralization and sort of the democratization of currency uh, effectively creates these like virtual sovereignties that are sort of floating above the legacy sovereignties and the geographic sovereignties. And there's this real sort of schizophrenic uh, tug of war going on between the regulations from the past and how are we going to govern ourselves either virtually or in person or in the physical world? How is all that stuff going to fit together? So that's that's kind of an interesting question to me. And I'm not taking sides on, on anything that's been said so far. I'm just saying that this is a key and fundamental question that's arising partly out of the advance of technology, but also out of the advancement of our connectivity. I think that's an interesting point. And I would uh, suggest that we think about power and governance, starting with the appearance of human beings. Well, we can actually go back before that, but let's limit it to the first, the last several million years. Uh, the appearance of to human beings. So then there was like the caveman went and clubbed his mate, and then they got together into a tribe or some kind of a unit, right? The power was, a, was a, at, at any rate, the power was 100% physical. And that power was demonstrating like the defense department was the club against the tiger or whatever. I think you see what I'm saying. We got to a more sophisticated point 
uh, where suddenly money replaced that physical aspect, right? So then it was the money, the barons and the whoever else, the landowners and all of that. And that happened. And then there was the Industrial Revolution and that all continued. And it's continued till today. But then the T word that you mentioned, technology, came in. And that's a fascinating point because there was a there was a moment where maybe in the mid 90s where nobody knew anything about the internet except a very 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 few people so you had power on that level right and by the way even before that if you think about spreading information and another power is information and who controls it so the gateways were uh hearst and companies like that now it's fox and uh, and MSNBC and so on, but so those medias who are becoming displaced by online stuff, by technology, and Facebook is one of those things, right? Um, Google Plus never made it to that level, but Google itself has an incredible amount of power that's not transparent at all. And this suit we just mentioned, uh, the fine that we just mentioned, um, shows that they were screwing around with ads, which is all you know. Okay, yeah, right. Nobody who doesn't know that they do that. Uh, but like Facebook, this is actually potentially serious in that they're showing you stuff that isn't necessarily the most, uh, the most doesn't have the most merit as far as truth or anything else. So I think you, you actually invoke an interesting topic there, Jay, because governance becomes pretty complicated. It wasn't complicated when you had the club and the tribe and hey, you know, you chest beating the chest and you beat the guy up and then you were the boss. And then from there, well, we, you made the rules. We don't even have to go back that far, Randy, because think about just the year 2007, which was, you know, what, 11, 12 years ago. For us to be as connected as we are sitting in this video conference, well, first of all, we weren't having video conferences like this, right? But if you wanted to experience the internet, you pretty much had to go sit down in front of your probably desktop computer at that point turn it on, sign in, you know, the experience was radically different in, in our connectivity in 2007 than it is today, because now it's this, and this is always on, and we're always connected, and we're connected with pretty much, you know, five or six billion people around the world, um, not the entire 7.3 billion or whatever, but that's, that's probably short-lived. Um, so it's, you know, we are in this new realm of connectivity and blurring of the legal, the government constructs, all this stuff is on the table. And I think that's a really interesting thing to take a look at. And I think it's also one of the things that's most in need of innovation, as well as probably one of the biggest friction points at this time regarding, you know, things moving forward and every time something moves forward there's new problems that open up so there's another aspect to what you just said too which was whoops seems to i'm on the wrong thing here uh which is that that connectivity works in both directions so not only are we getting all this stuff on this phone this device that's always on but the the people at the other end starting with your t your telephone company for example your your provider are also getting everything you do and regardless of whether they admit that, they know every site you go to, they know everything you're doing. And uh, even if everything's encrypted, a lot of people know what's going on. And governments, of course, your local uh, people where you live and who, the people who run your country have a pretty good idea of what's going on. In fact, that harkens back to um, uh, I have a hole in my memory. Um, the guy who lay bare all of the my clip of the petition. Yeah, I know that. <laughs> Edward you. Snowden. Snowden is the word I was looking for. Yeah, that was uh, very, very much amazing uh, what happened there. So, well, that's a great point, Randy, because yesterday I got in my car and I start the, the car and I looked down at my phone and my phone is telling me how many minutes it's going to take me to get to my destination, my next destination. I don't even know what my next destination is. And my my phone knows where they think I'm gonna go, so uh, you know it's 
there's there's this connectivity is opening up new questions and new problems so anyway i still think that if we let the uh, corporations and companies and uh, national governments to encroach on to governance of uh, the web and internet um we're not giving you're not we're not uh, making anyone a favor uh it's we, we are in it's this a sort of situation like the uh far west so with a new frontier with a new land uh with a, a governance from afar that was at that time uh the united kingdom and, and the, the, the people that migrated in uh, the united states uh with locals that uh know the ropes and get around everything uh but the common people get screwed over and over again uh so carado do you do you think that the the, the legacy govern governance or governments the the geographic governments can effectively control what's happening with our connectivity uh, of course they do uh they think of right china now. Yep, China. That's the example, think, I was thinking of yeah. Uh, uh, well, although it's a, uh, depending on your opinion, a positive uh, action. New Zealand is uh, censoring a number of websites now after that terrorist attack. So it's it's already happening. Yeah, well, beyond the Great let's, Firewall, let's you also have you also have the way that China is using the per pervasive connectivity for. Um, that social credit system they're coming up with and those sorts of things. And again, there's, that's all sounds, there's lots of positive things. We keep on concentrating the negative because like everything in life, it's easier to just talk about the negative, but those are things we have to worry about. Um, and we've been voluntarily giving up this information to companies for 10, 20 years now to the point where it's feeding into machine learning algorithms to guess where your home, you know, which, which your home or how long are you going to go from, how long is your commute going to be and those sorts of things. Um, that data is all available to other people. Um, and as you said, the Great Firewall was set up long before Russia is planning on trying to set up the same sort of thing in Russia. Uh, and, uh, you know, I don't know if regulation is the, right, the right thing or not, but certainly uh, unfettered, it's going to have lots of artifacts which can have lots of negative consequences as well as positive. And no one's really thinking about the negatives until there's a giant data breach or... Yep. Some other well, have so, a practical, so, have so, a practical hey, side hey, sidebar hey, for this. It's like Michael, if I could interrupt, I'm sorry, but uh, I, I have a question for Hank because you're our diaspora expert. Is diaspora vulnerable to government, you know, individual government intervention? I mean, one of the things I I was concerned about with the recent uh, legislation that went through the EU Parliament on um, basically um, the copyright law stuff was that uh, it's great if you have a giant machine which is doing a lot of the uh, con like making sure you're not someone's not posting copyrighted material. But for smaller providers, there really wasn't. There was some language that was added towards the end, which made it so that um, supposedly if you if you're under a certain size and You've only been around for two years, then you're you're exempted. But if I'm just setting up my own instance of a server that's three years old, am I now liable for that? And I think one of the reasons why there isn't as much pushback from the larger companies is because they have all of the infrastructure to right. do those sorts of things and they want to monetize it anyway. So they actually can leverage that versus smaller providers won't. Certainly, uh, there is the pot. It's servers that are owned by individuals, mostly. Uh, I don't think there are any corporate owned servers, but even if there were, um, they're just as liable to be to be strong armed by governments, uh, local or or national as anybody else is. So from that perspective, it is. However, it's a mesh. So just because one server is down, taken out doesn't mean that uh, all of them are taken out in that way. It's much more like the original Internet, which is it's a loose collection of machines that know how to talk to each other versus a, a, a megalith. Uh, that um, op op operates as one enormous machine. But ultimately, we're still connected by something that the power company or the uh, the the country's government 
through power, through fiber, through whatever, however you're connected, copper wires, whatever it is, they can just shut that off. And so the only safe way to have an internet that isn't under anybody's control is to get Elon to launch enough satellites or some crazy solution like that. I don't know if any of you remember, Hank, you weren't here, but uh, the rest of you, I think we had a guy on who had a system of, I think it was a mesh system. Karate, you must remember this. He was in Africa, I think. Yes, or? yes. I, I and like that. That, it's called Village Voice. Uh, was no, it? No, no, no. It wasn't. It was something, it was, it was something entirely, entirely different that you had to load on uh, your phone. It was using Bluetooth for creating a, lo a small local network and was using whatever uh, connectivity you had on that phone to relay the connectivity around. It was used in, in rural areas in extreme conditions and of for uh, emergency relief and everything else. But if you went from community to community, one of the fascinating aspects was if you couldn't reach somebody through the existing mesh or whatever, uh, it would hold it would on to forward. It. it would hold on to it. And then when it found the other phone, I think they even talked to each other directly or something. Anyway, that's not really 100% what we're talking about, but it's well, it kind of it kind of is right, Randy, uh, because because uh, you know it, it is. I think it's directly a, a, a point of what we're talking about because there the technology is moving into a realm that that pushes everything out to the peers, i.e., the individual servers that Hank was talking about, and we are building and experimenting and innovating around protocols that don't need the traditional TCP IP or, you know, the other methods that have been the choke points in our communications. So, and I apologize to Michael because I cut you off a little bit earlier, Michael. Sorry. No problem. I um, deserve that because I <laughs> often get excited and jump in. Um, I have um, a practical side to all of this, and that is, um, it's harkens back a few moments, but um, this week I've done something for the first time and I told Randy about this earlier. And, and I am in fact joined to the Hangout right now and to ZipDX using the Brave web browser, which is Brave. Chrome derived, but contains some blockchain and maybe one of you all well-informed gentlemen could explain to me the merits of that. I think it has something to do with getting paid for content, but, but that's all that I know. It is, however, being Chrome derived, though, it does things that, you know, it works with Jitsi Meet. And if it works with Jitsi Meet, which is sort of one of the most sophisticated WebRTC applications in existence, it's probably going to work with most things. The reason why this is significant for me and potentially for ZipDX is that we require interpreters who use our multilingual facility to use Chrome to interpret. We have clients in China. In China, access to the website, the Google website, where you would fetch Chrome is blocked by the Great Firewall. So the ability to have an alternative in Brave and say, OK, while we don't 100% support it, you can use Brave and have that not be blocked by the Great Firewall is, in fact, a tremendous benefit. And it it's good for non-technical people who, until Brave came along, we would have to say, Find somebody who knows what a VPN is, and then you can fetch fetch Chrome. So, Michael, do you know the history behind Brave? Uh, I do I, not. I'm uh, open yeah. to it. I've, I've uh, looked at it. Uh, they're using the code from, uh, uh, let me say, uh, a slimmed down and cleaned version of Chromium. That is the engine right. behind Google Chrome, and it's called UnGoogle Chromium. So they've taken out a lot of uh, uh, oh that, that that that's the several project that we were talking about before. Um, they're uh, they're using the same rendering engine and many other uh, parts of uh, what is under Google Chrome, but they are taking away and taking out practically all the code that is calling home is calling back to Google servers. So it's hallelujah. Hallelujah. Exactly. <laughs> this uh, is exactly uh, what I want. There's, there's no VPN around it, but it's using uh, blockchain because there's a feature inside where you uh, get credits because uh, in the many features that Brave has, it's practically blocking most or if not all of the ad 
content uh, ads uh, and ads uh, circuits automatically has an, an ad blocker, but because they don't want uh, blocking ads um, take it, take money away from good and reputation and good with sites with good reputation and good ethics if you subscribe to their network you get money through uh that uh virtual currency i don't remember now how they are calling it that is based on blockchain so you uh if you have a website you subscribe to that uh, to that circuit and you get money when people with uh, surfing with brave go on your web website so that is where the blockchain is is to take uh, to record that that event that um, somebody visited your, your website another so way to monetize yeah just a real quick thing here this so here's the slide of uh, VUC 656 in case anybody's interested in that serval project with dr. Paul the dr. Paul Gardner Stefan was an interesting thing. It's it's an off the wall thing, but it is for basically for villages and I think it was in Africa. I would assume uh, fascinating thing. But these are the kinds of efforts that are probably needed for us to progress in the ways that you're talking about. Go ahead, whoever. So cut off. so uh, two two things on on Brave, Michael, in addition, and everyone else is a key figure behind Brave is Brendan Ike, who basically. Uh, wrote javascript and he's you know he's on a campaign to free the browser from this massive communication that's primarily as you say calling home to provide data for advertisers and so forth uh, and you know which uh, according to the things that i've heard constitutes about half of our data plan so, you know, uh, the data okay. usage yeah. that we're incurring, about half of it is, is kind of going on unbeknownst to us where our, you know, smartphones and our browsers and blah, blah, blah are reporting back our browsing habits and so forth. So that's, one, that's a little bit around Brave. But the other thing you might be interested in taking a look at is Beaker Browser, which is a key piece to a, a, a project called DAT, which is very much akin to IPFS. And it is a decentralized construct of, you know, peer-to-peer -peer networking that uh, sort of is, is built around this, this Beaker browser. I haven't e used either Beaker browser or Brave, and I don't hold coins in either of them. And I don't own coins in Filecoin, which is the IPFS uh, related project. Um, but those, those actually, those three projects are along the lines of what we're talking about, where there's this emerging peer to peer mesh network, if you will, that's sort of going over the top of the legacy systems. And in fact, IPFS, it's my understanding, was banned in China for a while. And, you know, because of the very nature of the architecture of the construct and the protocol, they really can't ban it. And IPFS has been uh, uh, state attack tested at least twice, where the uh, Turkish government took down the, the Wikipedia page. Uh, for the Turkish Wikipedia and the, the folks at Protocol Labs rebuilt the Turkish Wikipedia page using IPFS. Same thing happened when there was the conflict or in the conflict between Spain and Catalonia. So uh, there's actually some, um, some, uh, some, some you know actual tests of exactly what we're talking about in this this blending of governance legacy governance technology and business models so who else has got news here we're up to three million four hundred twenty seven hundred eighty seven thousand seven hundred eighty six by the way live reporting from uh, isn't there been it's not that live because I don't know they've gone to maybe 30 seconds or a minute or two or even more. Yeah, possibly. 
There are two uh, Twitter bots following this, by the way. That's how incredible. I mean, it's probably more than two. I was wondering if anyone's been following the Debian Project's um, elections pro for the De Debian Project lead. Has anyone else been following that? No. Tell us more about it. So uh, they have an entire process laid out for how they elect their new leaders and the election, the, the current pr uh, uh, project leads uh, tenure uh, expires in a few weeks. And so the idea behind how the Debian project de deals with that is that people put in their, 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 their slate or whatever, and then the members vote on them. And then if someone gets a majority vote, I think it has to be a, an absolute majority, not a plurality. They become the new Debian project lead. And then though it's not like that is like the uh, it's more of like a prime minister than a than a president type of thing in terms of uh, they're not uh, they're not like the all powerful entity. There's lots of there's lots that goes down to larger to um, to to uh, smaller organizations. Well, anyway, so the current tenure is up. I think it's a two year tenure. And uh, the slate, the number of slates that they had to uh, choose from. Uh, by the deadline, which I think was eight weeks out from the end, were zero. So no one has raised their hand and said they want to be the new Debian project lead. And then so now they're going and getting another call for those uh, for someone to nominate themselves, and they still have zero. The only hiccup is that there is nothing that says that the current president is the president for life until the new one is, mm. is removed, and the current president doesn't want to rerun, or project lead, sorry. So there is a question about what will happen to the Debian projects, the leadership structure in the absence of a, it will go on. It's not like the president, the, the project would die, but it is a bit of an unprecedented moment where the, there may not be a Debian project lead for a period of time. And I'm curious why they're having a hard time getting people to raise their hand because they have conferences. I see a lot of conferences with dozens of people all over the world. So I am not a Debian project member. I use Debian Linux derivatives with Ubuntu and Vint, but, uh, and a little bit of Debian, but not really. So I found the whole process a little jarring, but fascinating at the same time. Maybe somebody doesn't, maybe nobody wants to take on the responsibility unless it, I assume it's not something paid either. It's a voluntary thing, right? Voluntary. I would imagine. So yeah, well, maybe it is the stipend, you know, but I mean, it's a lot of work. It's just like why asking why nothing's moving in diaspora, right? You should know something about that. Uh, in fact, you know, I've been telling people that they should contribute to volunteers and stuff. And uh, I finally was, you may have seen this, Hank, if you followed uh, the topic, the discussion on discourse where diaspora is discussed. Um, I'm starting to go cold on that whole thing because people are going, well, you know, uh, we may not want to have bigger intake and a lot more people getting on it. I don't know. I just, I'm a little soured on the fact that nothing's moving. And so I was trying to push people into donating and uh, doing bounties and stuff. And then I got told by a few people who are, who are much closer to the project than either of us, I would say, ah, you know, well, it's not a question of money. I, did you see that answer, by the way? Somebody said, oh, it's not a question of money. We have money. So I, I was very confused. By um, I'm I'm. Uh, you know, you're behind it. Shame to say, I haven't been following discourse very, very closely. Well, I don't follow it either. I just happened to go post there and got a few responses. That's yeah. When I was in hot and heavy on the API development, I was I was there regularly and and answering questions and all of that. Uh, I haven't been developing software much the last couple of months. I, I swear, if, I I mean it when I say I'm I'm meaning to get back to it, but I haven't been. Um, and as I said um, in um, in a in a blog post I posted a few weeks ago, I did this cross Fediverse experiment with Friendica because Friendica had massive numbers of protocols. I mean, it links into pretty much every social system that there is except for Facebook because Facebook Please. took that ability away uh, and it worked really well. There, there are, there are some, there, there are some rough edges on the UI and stuff, but having like all of my Mastodon and pixel fed and funk whale and Twitter and diaspora and Friendica all in one place in one unified stream was so compelling that my little experiment for how I would want to approach that for doing activity pub integration in diaspora I stuck with Friendica because I have a one-stop shop for everything that's not mm -hmm. Facebook for my social media. Now, uh, with that, one of the reasons why I was a big diaspora contributor was because I was using it every day throughout the day. I mean, it was my portal to my to the Fediverse mm -hmm. uh, when I wasn't using Mastodon. 
now everything I'm doing, I'm, you can still see my posts on, on diaspora. It's just, it's my friend account now. Right. The only hiccup I have is for some reason, the, the, uh, icon for your profile that doesn't federate over to diaspora right now. I, that's one of the things I want to work on when I finally get back to, to coding again. But, um, yeah. So, uh, who was there a developer who said they're not interested in having more people, or was it no, uh, just some I, chatter? No, I agglomerated it in lots of different conversations I've had. But uh, here's what I would like to do: we have not a lot of time left, but I'd like to talk about federation because we're on the topic anyway, and, and it and it joins with all of these things that Jay brought up and Corrado and Michael, and but what I'm hoping is that people can come to understand what it actually means. And I don't mean the word, which I think everybody does know what it means, but what you just said, Hank, uh, makes it clear if they just knew how this stuff was connected. So there's a, I'm going to try to explain it in the simplest terms possible and very quickly that these uh, federated platforms have different ways of exchanging. It's a protocol, right? Just like the SIP protocol for VoIP, which we don't talk about anymore. <laughs> or or X X two, anyway, they this stuff is all built in. So the point is, if you're trying to wean yourself from Facebook or you're a refugee from Google Plus, which is ending in just a few days, it's really, in my opinion, and this is what I've been shouting everywhere, ad nauseum, it's really important not to consider going to yet another silo, and that would be Facebook, that would be me we and uh, whatever else is out there. Uh, so federation is important. And what Hank just said is super because you could get all your Twitter and be on all of these different platforms within one interface. And yes, there are a few little gotchas, like he said, the profile thing and all that. I have just gotten on Friendica today, like an hour ago, and haven't had a chance to explore it much. But the, but the point of it is that you own your data. Uh, if one pod goes down, a pod is like an instance for Mastodon. Uh, we were running a Mastodon instance, in, uh, instance, but uh, unfortunately there weren't enough people who cared, so I stopped paying for it. <laughs> but the point is you can be everywhere and you're not getting ads and you're not, you don't have to be worried about algorithms manipulating the, uh, the content you're seeing. You're in control. So if you wanna be in control, that's the way to go. I don't even think Facebook's particularly good looking, by the way. I mean, Google Plus was a little better, but I always hated the way that looked. Now, MeWe, which I looked at and joined for like 20 seconds, is very slick. And some of the other, there was Vero or something. There was another network. These networks look really good because they take the time to make put designers on them, and they look great. But in the end, you'll find that in the case of MeWe, I've been hearing that there's a lot of alt-right activity on it and that they're encouraging it or something you know it, whether it's right or left i don't want to not interested in that but the main thing is to stay off the silo and get into the federation and and work with that find a place that's worth the effort yes your friends won't be on it because you know there's too many things to be on but you will be connected and i think that's what's important well if you use a, a system that can tap into a number of feeds you can find all your friends in your own feed. And that, Except that, Facebook. Yeah, uh, instead of just using 12 different windows on your computer or, or scrolling between uh, all your applications on your uh, mobile phone, you have just one single point of entry, and that's a positive. Uh, what is sadly a negative is that the size of uh, people on the main platforms will always swamp the the input and the interaction you have on other platforms so uh, it's going to drive you anyway the interactions you have are going to drive you anywhere anyway on that platform so you need to tailor the number of people you're following and you're followed with on different platforms weeding out all the draws let's uh, say that clearly uh, so you balance your platforms because uh, on some platforms there's a, a different trend on one side or the other and many other many differences in uh, viewpoints uh, more libertarian or more social or, uh, so you you need to be to tailor your experience uh, measuring exactly what you're getting from the from the different platforms is basically also better because most of these 
uh, universal interfaces are using APIs, as we discussed before, uh, they're accessing the raw data that is underneath the, the um, um, social media feed. So you're not seeing those promoted tweets or uh, the ads uh, on the side of the, the uh, timeline in Facebook and so on. So it's unfiltered and uh, not, I don't know if we discussed that before, but proprietary uh, applications, apps on your mobile phones have besides the feed, uh, other additional uh, data collection mechanisms and uh, other filters that are enhancing your experience. Exactly. It's not the, the, the exact feed you're looking for when you subscribe to people. Uh, so uh, the, the, the uh, federation like uh, what we used to use, uh, like Hootsuite to connect a number of different uh, platforms, is always accessing the APIs a little more raw, less filtered by the application. And the, one of the biggest things to remember, too, is that in something like MeWe or Hootsuite, there's a business plan there. There's money to be made, and they want to make it, and that's fine. There's nothing wrong with that. But that's I don't want to go through that process. And so here you're dealing with volunteers. I wanted to ask you, Hank, uh, but this is true of anybody who can answer it. I mean, this is true. This is aimed at anybody who can answer it. Um, how much di is there a difference in the way the interfaces look on uh, Friendica? Do people do pod masters or whatever they're the admins? Do they make changes to the CSS and so on to make the interface look a little different? Or is it personalized or do they pretty much all look the same? They can. I actually I've only used one instance, and I and my, the, my development instance is uh, just the generic one. There's a lot more plugins and those sorts of customizations that are built in. And of course, you still can edit the CSS and all that. Whether they do or not, I do not know. Because it's common yeah. on Mastodon as it happens. I don't know if you've noticed that, but if you go around to the different instances of Mastodon, they've messed with it to an extent. And well, it, and the other are... thing, well, so the other thing that's different than you're going to see on those is the user can select among different themes, and so it's a question of which themes that they've installed. So the the um, administrator of the Friendica server will specify the default theme, but like the one I'm on has five different themes. And the, first, the, the default one is a little too dense and confusing to me. There's just lots of buttons, uh, which I didn't like. It felt cluttered. I went to a, th a simpler theme until I got more, it was much more of like a Twitter type of very thin down experience. Mm -hmm. And then once I got my bearings, it, I actually went back to the other theme because it was a, it had a couple more bells and whistles. But the users have a little bit more control over their theming than they do on any other platform I've ever seen in terms of the social... Um, media systems which is kind of cool okay great uh, i have to say just one one thing there's a new um ue design for twitter uh, if you want to try it uh, is more uh is much cleaner uh, more essential and is more akin to what is the your mobile experience on the web on, desktop, on the desktop yes you yeah. can choose uh, uh the new ui uh, and is it's, it's still, little... got, it still got all the crap, you know, you might, you know, did you miss this from this? You know, that, that stuff is just so yeah, yeah, yeah. horrible. Yeah. You know, it's really, you had the best idea, which is to use the API and build your own, use your own feed yeah. or whatever. Yeah. There's exactly. also a way to do this with RSS. I think, um, I don't know about Twitter, but a lot of these things you can make up your own RSS. You use an RSS client to, I don't know, some, there's a way to do that. I don't know what it is. I I've actually I actually do all my most of my Twitter browsing through Friendica now because it thins out a lot of that stuff. It's just what comes across the API. So cool. I actually have to go over to Twitter to like there's specific people I want to just read their their feed. I could technically do that inside of Friendica, but it's a little more cumbersome. But otherwise, most of my uh, Twitter and it's interspersed among all of the other social networks that are tied into Friendica in the same way, which is kind of cool. And it's nice that Friendica actually shows you which social network the posts are coming from and which protocol they use to get it. So I had no idea how many people I was uh, interacting with on Diaspora, which were actually Hubzilla people, or those sorts of things, because they had they had implemented the Diaspora federating protocol, and that was kind of mm -hmm. that was very insightful. Right. Okay, we're done. Anybody else? Uh, did we forget something? Anybody else want to say anything before we say goodbye? Nothing but silence here. Come on. Well, I, I just think I, I want to thank everybody for the conversation. I think what we covered today, many of the points are the topics of the day. So 
I think we could continue this conversation for sure. Well, that's what we're going to do. It'll be VUC 745 next week. And I can't remember if it's the right time for us or not. When is daylight savings time? Is it this Sunday? Daylight saving time. This Sunday in Europe or, or the next Sunday? I think it's the last Sunday of the month. Um, no, it's going to be next week. And for now, that's it. Thank you.